I started Bad Birdie with the sole goal to like buy a house in LA and maybe make a couple extra grand a month to pay for a mortgage. That was my whole okay. goal is like, I want to start a business as a side hustle. A year and a half into it, my buddy was like, dude, you should just meet with these guys in Miracle Mile. These guys like are wealth advisors, like just pitch them idea, just let them kind of hear what you're working on. So I went and met with these guys strictly to kind of get some advice or here they work with a bunch of clients. And they were all like, oh yeah, when this thing's a $20 million company, when this thing's a $50 million company, I was like, what? It was this big shift for me where these guys were just like talking to me, like you'll do a million next year, then you'll do 5 million and then 20. And I was like, what? I never really thought this was more outside of my apartment. This is Start of the Storefront. Today's guest is Jason Richardson, around an attire that hasn't changed since the 20s, as in the 1920s. Jason wanted to change that stereotype, but as you just heard, he only started the company as a way to make a couple extra bucks. Sometimes it takes an outsider's perspective to know what you've got. And after that fateful meeting, he dove headfirst into growing Bad Birdie into a company that reminds people just how much fun golf can actually be. So listen in as we cover everything from how a missed putt by Robert Herjavec allowed him to keep an extra 5% of his company, how he wants to make the sport of golf more inclusive, and find out why he doesn't actually play that many rounds of golf. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we have the founder of Bad Birdie, Jason. Jason, tell us a little bit about Bad Birdie and what, what, what you're trying to achieve in the golf world. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. So Bad Birdie started it three years ago out of my apartment, kind of with this idea and thinking about being a golfer myself, that golf is the funnest sport to me to play. And I think that kind of the goal of Bad Birdie is to make it fun for anyone who wants to play. And we do that by reimagining how, you know, the culture around golf, how it can be reshaped and of course not undermining the rules of the game at all. And then primarily we're known for our polos um, that are just really stand out the performance polo, super comfy and creating a premium product that people can wear on the course. And we're getting into, you know, we do hats, but just continuing to expand into basically any type of golfer, whether you're playing at a country club, a muni course, you're going to go out and play a nine hole, like par three, like, we got you covered. I like it. One of the things that I always think about, so I play, I used to play a lot of golf, play a lot of tennis now. And both of these sports, it's oh, like- say, I play tennis, dude. I, I love tennis. Oh, that's what's up, Jason. That's what's up. We got to move into tennis, man. I'm telling tennis and golf, there's like, it's almost like the fashion world said, let's take all of our dropouts and put them in these two sports so they never look good. And it's, yeah. it's the most confusing thing. You know, it's like, I have these golf shoes that are basically Air Force Ones, but they're legit golf shoes. They're Nike. And yeah. I walk on the course. People just look at me like I'm crazy. Like, those aren't golf shoes. I'm like, dude, these are golf shoes. I'm just from the future because your brand is so old fashioned. Yeah. Is that something that you're constantly fighting as a business? Yeah, I think, I don't think we're constantly fighting it as much. I think for the older generation, sure. Or like I was wearing Jordans the other day on the course and someone's like, oh, those are actually golf shoes. Like halfway through the round, like I thought you're just wearing like tennis <laughs> shoes. So yeah, I think, I think like the younger generation gets it. I think if you're like 20, you know, even you're in high school playing golf to let's say you're like 35, 40, that range, like you're in that younger who's on Instagram up to date with current trends. I think that people are pretty used to it. But once you get into like that older, you know, your kids are in high school, you're going to be a grandpa or something like, I think those guys are generally like, whoa, what's going on here? That's crazy. Yeah. Why the name? Give us a window into why the name Bad Birdie. Oh, yeah. I mean, the name honestly has no special story or meaning behind it other than I had the idea for Bad Birdie and I never could land on the name. So I was like, shit, what am I going to name it? I knew there had to be like a really cool name that just kind of fit and like was kind of edgy or something. And so basically had a, um, a list of all golf slang, like ace, birdie, bogey. And I was just sitting in my room one day. I was like, I need, I'm just going to sit and like think on naming. And I like, was like, okay, let me try alliteration. So I was like, I started with, it was like ace, birdie, bogey, ace. I was like, alpha ace, that's lame, blah, blah, blah. You know, bogey, birdie, <laughs> bad birdie. I was like, oh, bad birdie sounds dope. I was living with three other guys in this four bedroom apartment. They were all watching like football in the other room. I walked out I was like, guys, it's going to be called bad birdie. They're like, oh, that's sick. So yeah, it really just kind of was like a name that hit. And like, you know, the bigger meaning behind it is like bad. I think of like, is bad mean you're like actually bad at golf or does it mean you're actually like bad like in a cool way there's no such thing as a birdie that's bad so it kind of has this meaning that's like you don't really know what it means and it's kind of that's kind of the whole point of it 
I kind of like it. It makes me think of like, uh, if yeah. I'm like, I'm 120 yards out, I'm on a wedge. I can't see the pin, the, the holes in, I birdie. It's a bad birdie, but yeah. it's the best yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I don't really say like, oh, that's, we don't really use that language a lot in our like idea. Sure. Like, oh, that's a bad birdie. But I think, yeah, it's totally, there's no <laughs> such thing about it. There's no such thing as an actual bad birdie. Well, I always like it because it evokes a, uh, a very cool image because like the name lens, like if you had named it Alpha Ace or something like that, you don't yeah. necessarily get such a cool logo, but with the birdie, you can at least have an animal, and I, I tend to like companies with animal mascots because I think there is a more, there are more options for creativity with that type of logo. You know, were there yeah. other iterations? So, so right now your logo is like a cartoon burr with a like X for eyes. X eyes. Were there yep. other iterations of that that you went through before landing on that design? Yes, uh, actually the design was probably the easiest part of starting the whole business. Um, I referenced a couple logos. I also am a cyclist and I referenced the Rafa logo mm -hmm. for the script. And then for the birdie, I work with, I have to give a shout out to my buddy Drew, who I've worked with for like probably seven, eight years before I used to work in advertising and he's a designer. And I was like, he pitched a couple ideas and one of them was the actual birdie that you see you know, just with the normal eye. And the other one was this birdie with like X dot eyes. And I just was like, Hey, let's take those two and combine them. So it was literally like V2. We locked it in and the script itself was like locked on the first time. So that's the easiest part of this whole business was like the actual logo design. There's been so many things that are a lot harder. So you got to take it where you can. I'm a yeah. cyclist too. It's crazy. I was just wearing a Rafa hat yesterday. It's on my Instagram right now. Oddly yeah. Enough. I feel um, like there's, there's kind of this, like, I don't know if it's just ours. Like I'm 32. Like when you get in your thirties, it's like you're golfing, cycling and playing tennis. A lot of like the active, like, I don't know guys are like, dude, let's go play like basketball. Like my knee hurts. So. <laughs> what was the first thing that you, you started? Was it, was it a shirt? What was like kind of like your first product line? Yeah, it was all shirts. I originally was going to start with like three shirts and then I, had three designs and just realized it's like very, very small quantity for people to pick from. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up launching with six shirts and um, yeah, just polos. I made a hundred polos. I ran the business, you know, I was like I had another full-time job. I used to work as a line producer in advertising. It's like a very niche job in commercials, basically making TV commercials. And I would do that freelance and I do this on the side. And yeah, I basically was like, came up with six shirt designs, like at night working with my buddy Drew to like design it. And yeah, like just very like scrappy figuring out how to make t-shirts and all that stuff. Yeah. What was your first step? Was it social media or did you go ahead and try to partner up with some of the local golf shops? Maybe a mix of both. What was the first oh, thing to get it, to get it launched? Yeah. Yeah. So I had a hundred polos, a Shopify store and to get it out. I remember the first day I put it live, I like posted on my own social and it was like my mom, my friend, I was just his best man at his wedding. Someone I was working with on set that day. And like, it was like that for like the first two weeks. But then what I did is I remember I got home the night I launched and I sent DMs to like five golf influencers um, who I'd been following that were kind of like, you know, like hole in one trick shots, coach Rusty, mm -hmm. the Butsy. I don't know if you guys follow golf Instagram world, but all those guys at that point, they really hadn't been sponsored. And even three years ago, it was a totally different game. on like influencer marketing, but they all were like, these are dope. Send us uh, some polos. So I sent them some polos and they just posted it like wearing it. And I remember the first day, uh, one of the guys posted, I sold like seven polos and I was like, Oh shoot, what are these? Like, uh, that that's working. And so basically let's say I sent it, I gave it to a bunch of those guys. They sold maybe 30 polos from just posting and wearing and people commenting. Wow. And the thing with bad birdie is like, if you wear it on a course, probably like an 80% chance someone's going to be like, Hey man, where's your shirt from? Mm -hmm. And so we probably sell like, every four shirts we sell, we probably get like one to two organic sales from it. So I think it just kind of started growing. And then, yeah, basically just kind of that initial push. I kept those guys stocked with polos for the first little bit, but then it just kind of became a word of mouth thing. And I was selling, I think I sold like $4,000 in the first month, which is probably around 50, 60 polos, which isn't bad at all, but it's also like yeah, not that's that great. many polos. Right, right. Just so. the beginning. And then what are the semblances? You're getting a bunch of market signals. And then at some point you decide to say, Hey, let me apply on to shark tank and see what this is like. Well, yeah. I mean, actually, no, not at all. It's, I, I started bad birdie with the sole goal to like buy a house in LA and maybe make a couple extra grand a month and pay for a mortgage. That was my whole okay. goal is like, I want to start a business as a side hustle. I love like, I like doing, being a producer fits my strengths. I love that. I get to travel around the world, do like, you know, the glitz and glam. I mean, it's not really glitz and glam of filmmaking, but like I got to, 
just do a bunch of cool projects and work with a bunch of cool brands. And um, I loved it. But I was like, hey, I could start a business on the side. I like playing golf. So for the first year, like I was just always on, honestly, for the first year and a half, like I did it for a year. I was like, I'm gonna see if I can sell a thousand shirts in a year. I sold like a thousand and ten. And then the next year, I remember I went on the trip and I was like, hey, my, my current employee now who's grown a ton was, he was like shipping for me. He started shipping. It was still a small side hustle. I was like, hey man, can you kind of run my side hustle, handle customer service and the shipping? I still was thinking like, we're doing like $4,000 a month, maybe 6,000, 7,000 if it was good. I was still thinking this was a side hustle. A year and a half into it, my buddy was like, dude, you should just meet with these guys in Miracle Mile. These guys like are wealth advisors, like just pitch them idea, just or like just kind of hear what, let them kind of hear what you're working on. It was just kind of like a soft intro. So I went and met with these guys strictly to kind of get some advice or hear they work with a bunch of clients. And they were all like, oh yeah, when this thing's a $20 million company, when this thing's a $50 million company, I was like, what? Like, it was this big shift for me where I was sitting in this, like, on like the 40th floor in Miracle Mile in LA, the top, like, I was like, and these guys were just like talking to me like, oh yeah, you're going to be a, you'll do a million next year, then you'll do 5 million and then 20. And I was like, what? I never really thought this was more outside of my um, apartment. So that was the first shift that kind of was like, I could try to raise money. I could try to just keep grinding it out. Like there's potential here where people that see other entrepreneurs work with them on a daily basis. There's no question in their mind that this could be a, a legit company. And so, yeah, did that for, that was like maybe like, yeah, that was like a year and a half in. And then a year after that, I got hit up by Shark Tank casting. Um, I didn't apply to the show. I've watched that show for 10 years. Like when I was living in the the place where I started it, I had three other roommates and every Saturday morning, I'm an early riser. I'd get up and be like watching Shark Tank at like 7 a.m. from the night before on Hulu. <laughs> yeah. And they'd always give me crap about it. They'd be like, yo, dude, why, why is you always watching Shark Tank? They'd always be like, oh, Jason, why don't you pitch us your fake Shark Tank product? Like it was always like this inside joke kind of like they were all like sleeping in, you know, from the night before we were in our 20s, you know, going yeah. out and stuff. And I would just like get up early and like watch Shark Tank and be like, okay, like critiquing like that or like thinking about the pitches, but I never had any idea to go on the show. And then I think it was 2019, the beginning of last year, I got a email from casting. It was like, Hey, I work with casting for Shark Tank. My husband's a golfer. I saw your company. I will let to talk to you about coming on the show. I mean, that's about how they get half of their people. And so basically went through that process, filmed it last September. So you film it and they're like, all right, it could air anytime. It may or may not air and it can film anytime. It could air between October and like May. And so for me, I was like, shoot, I hope it doesn't air in like November or December when it's like the worst season for golf because it's like sure. freezing. So it aired perfect time, April, I think third this year. And it was just honestly perfect timing, like beginning of golf season, just after the initial bump of COVID when everyone's freaking out and people actually like were super supportive. So yeah, that's a long winded answer, but. No, I, and I love, I mean, one of the things I watched the clip and one of the, I don't know if you thought to do this, it's, you probably did given the fact that you're waking up at 7 a.m. and critiquing, but just yeah. the fact that you had Robert, you made it, you made it like whatever, it's, it's what we do on the course, right? You're like, all right, yeah. put, put for dough, here we go, right? It's like, let's do it. Yeah. And you made him earn, or I guess you kept 5% of your company because Robert missed his yeah. cut. Amazing. Did you, I mean, you had that in the back of your head the whole time. You were like, this is what's going to go down. Yeah, if yeah. Offer. Yep. So prior to the show, I did like a, a session with like all the business guys I know. I had like four or five buddies come over to my place and it was like, all right, guys, this is like training. I, I have like every question and, you know, I gave them all my financials, everything. I was like, come to me with any questions. And like they basically during that, during the prep, they were talking about, they're like, dude, you know, all your financials and stuff. Like, what are you going to do when they negotiate with you? Hmm. And one of my buddies, Blake, who was actually my like, I used to work for him. Uh, he's a couple years older. And um, he was like, dude, you got to kind of figure out a way to negotiate with him on the spot. So he came up with the idea, which I always give credit for to him. He's like, dude, you got to figure out a way to like kind of bait them. Or if you can't negotiate, like, am I going to really be able to negotiate with a shark? Like I could try to, but I don't know. It's kind of tricky. I think like <laughs> I could be like, I wanted to get a deal. So he was like, dude, you should do something with putting. And so basically kind of came up with that idea, pitched it to the producers prior to the show and was like, Hey, if it comes down to it where I want to be able to do this. Can I do it? They're like, yeah, totally. It's cool. There's 0% staging on that show. Like you literally, they're like, if you walk in and fall, like we're not going to stop pulling the cameras. The only time we'll stop <laughs> pulling the cameras is if like one of our, there's a technical issue, but they're like, yeah, you do what you want. 
you can make and putt, you can do whatever. So I had it set up in the back of my mind. If I got to that spot where I was like, I mean, you guys saw me in the show. I was like, okay, how about 20, 20%? He's like, no, I'm like, uh, okay. Well, like the putt was perfect. It was the perfect fit for that. But if I didn't have that, I would have just been like, uh, I, right. I didn't know. Like, I, I just am not very good at negotiating. And I think I should have like, in hindsight, I like walked out. I was like, man, that putt saved my ass. But if it, if I hadn't done that, like I just would have been like, okay, sure. 25%. Yeah, for I sure. Don't know, I don't know how it would have gone, but yeah. Cause you got some of the leverage back. Yeah. And it was just like, it's totally like bad birdie style, you know, bait your buddy on the course and it comes like an inch short. I mean, it was like the perfect ending. So. Yeah. My favorite part of that was it happens to us all on the course. You know, we're more confident and cocky than we actually have skill to back up most of the time. But yeah. when Robert misses the putt, and then Kevin O'Leary comes in. He's like, let me show you how it's done. And then he misses yeah. the putt afterwards as well. It's yeah. just that, that perfect showmanship ahead of time. And then, oh, maybe, maybe I uh, overspoke yeah. afterwards. That was beautiful. Yeah. And so nice. when you got that deal, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you were initially looking for $300,000 for 10% of your company, right? Yeah. So when they doubled that and then, you know, with 25%, that would have been over double that. What was going through your mind? Was it ever a moment in your mind where you thought maybe I shouldn't take this deal? Yeah. So, you know, being the Shark Tank nerd I am, there's basically this girl who creates a, she has an, a shareable Google Excel sheet and she tracks every single deal on the show and bases asking price based on what the valuation is and the average deal get your company gets cut in half on the valuation and an apparel companies you know on shark tank it's not really open market rates at all you're going to get a lot higher you can raise a lot more but going on the show you're going to get about one to one and a half times your gross revenue so i had this all pre-planned and valued my company knowing that i would go down to a 1.5 million valuation and statistically i would have to double that to be able to get to that. Like kind of just kind of backed it out a little bit to try to be like, hey, based on every other deal that happens on the show, I'm probably gonna get, they're not, no one's gonna come in there and be like, yeah, I'll give you 10% right away. I mean, maybe they could have, but I just don't, I didn't think like being like a niche golf apparel brand, they would like every single shark would be jumping at it. Like, I think it was gonna be a very niche, like try to get a, maybe one or two offers on it. So I kind of backed out the deal knowing going in that I would be comfortable going with 20% for the same amount. What is Robert like as an investor? How has he been helpful to you? How have yeah. you seen like the results come in? Yeah, so Robert uh, is great. I'm actually seeing him, I think it's Thursday. He lives here in LA too. Yeah, he's provided, I mean, I think he's provided really high level thinking. We were talking about before we started, you know, moving the business to Arizona. I ran that by him and he was like, yeah, it's a great idea. You know, to save, to help grow, you know, save on taxes, on ops, really help scaling the business. You know, we, we had a, a new retailer come in and they wanted to sell online. And I was, I, I've been very like adamant of like, I don't want bad birdies sold anywhere online other than badbirdie.com. Um, just because we are, that's our main sales channel. And we do have some customers that are selling online that we're kind of phasing out and um, just kind of walking through that process, asking him th feedback on that has been good. And then, yeah, just bigger picture. Like I think we're talking on Thursday, just about bigger picture. Like, Hey, our company is thriving during COVID, which is crazy. And how we're going to continue to scale it. What are the next steps we can take to really develop a brand? I think for me, it's like, I did this company for three years without paying myself anything. It's been scrappy. But now, like Shark Tank's help just being where the company's at now. Like this year was the year to kind of like prove the model. And it's now starting to work to kind of start scaling. And so now it's like, okay, we see traction. How do we actually start doing that? What are the practical steps? Like, where am I spending money? How much inventory should I be financing? Like how much in certain, I would say riskier marketing, like sponsoring a pro or doing a bigger media buy with a publisher, like things like that. I think he'll be able to kind of help provide. And yeah, we're talking about this week. So you mentioned something interesting there about you think that Bad Birdie is uh, your website is the, the one place where you want to sell everything. But I did notice that your women's apparel is currently sold through third-party retailers. Is that something Correct. that you're phasing out and going to be bringing back to your own website? Yeah. So women's is a great question or a great top point of discussion. The women's line grew out of kind of my wife was like, Hey, why don't you make women's? And we launched women's like a year and a half in on black Friday. 
and a sleeveless polo in the middle end of November wasn't the best launch. And we sold a good amount, but historically what I've seen is for us on our branding, it's definitely like we have sold women's polos and they just don't sell. I can sell 200 men's polos for every one woman's polo. Our language, our branding is definitely targeted towards a, a male brand right now. And not to be that, not that we want to be exclusive to guys only. Like, I don't care if women wear, our, there's a lot of women that buy our shirts and wear them. But I think from a business perspective, it's been a strictly business decision right now that we kind of tested, put our toes in the water on women's. And for us as Bad Birdie to sell on our website, it didn't do as well. But the retail game and the wholesale game, like retailers crush it. They sell a ton of it because they have a lot of women buying in the store. If we could do, it's kind of the one part of the business where right now women's actually sells better in retail than it does for us. And so, yeah, we've, we basically, we basically make exclusive women's lines for like Shields. It's a Midwest chain and they're one of our, they're a great partner. And then Golf Town up in Canada, they sell up there too. So do I think we'll carry women's eventually? Yes. I think we need to do a little bit more support on, on our side on product development and branding. Like, I think it comes down to a point where it's like, I would want to hire a female to actually be running that side of the business and really connecting with that. Cause I think, yeah, it's my wife was helping out, but she has another full-time job. Like we need someone who's really leading that and that bringing that voice because there is a huge need in for women's golf apparel and kind of, I think there's a market for it. When you think about golf, so at a high level, like if we're analyzing the market, right? So there's a lot of studies that go either way. They say golf is decreasing in terms of market share when compared to other sports or some that say, Top golf is one of the reasons golf is growing, but top golf isn't really golf. It's a blast. The first time I actually went to top golf was in Arizona and just like super fun, but not golf. And so when you think about that at a high level, does it, does it impact any of your decision making or you just start thinking about like, how do we grow into other markets? We talked about tennis. Maybe that becomes a line. I, I don't know. Right. But I'm just trying to figure out what, what is in your growth model given the industry. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So I think in, from a macro level in the industry, I think the stats show that golf is pretty stagnant, right? It like drops and maybe goes up two to 3%. I think that golf will die if the culture doesn't change or it will continue to decline. Um, I think right now you have golf culture primarily, if you're outside the sport, super, super rich, super white, and it's super exclusive. You have to become part of it. There's like walls up. It's like you have to be part of a country club that kind of makes it trickier for people to get into it. I think the movement that's happening now in golf with there's a ton of brands out there doing it that are kind of becoming like the younger generation of golf, like a bad birdie or like, I don't know, a direct to consumer, like a vice golf balls or like, I mean, there's just so many from whether it's gear to apparel. I think that that type of cultural change will actually make it more accepting and more inclusive and more people actually enjoy it. I think the market itself, I think golf will always be around. I think, I don't know if it's all of a sudden going to become this, we're going to see a huge spike in it unless you get like another Tiger Woods type player to come in. But there's really no one like that right now. For me, like Tiger Woods, like everyone started playing golf when Tiger took off. But I think there's no one in that right now. I mean, there are younger guys that are playing, but not anyone like him. So I think golf's, I think golf's going to keep growing. I would say it's, I don't think it's going to skyrocket and be the fastest growing sport in America. And I don't really know if that's our, I don't know if that's necessarily our goal right now. I think for Bad Birdie, our goal is to be like, hey, we love this game and we want to help make it fun for anyone who wants to play and enjoy it. So, you know, another big barrier there too is golf has a steep learning curve. So, you know, we're always talking about ways to help getting people in the game and clinics or things like that down the road. So, and then jumping into the company specifically, I think that we're always going to be a golf brand right now. If we did ever launch, you know, another type of Bad Birdie brand, I think we would probably, I would probably put it under an umbrella of a something else versus bad birdie. I think bad birdie is so golf specific and you see it a lot with other brands, Travis Matthew, where they're a huge company now, but like the golfers are kind of, I feel like they're kind of moving away. Like the more committed golfers are kind of moving away from it because they're like, well, now they're kind of sold out and just like a men's lifestyle brand. I mean, they still sell hundred and you know, they probably sell a hundred times a year more than I do, but I think bad birdie will always be a specific golf brand. And at least the next couple of years. Will you always do clothing or will you branch out? You mentioned vice, golf balls, other things. Footwear. Yeah, I think, I think clothing. I think clothing. I mean, I, I'm a huge shoe guy. I, my goal as a kid was always to like design shoes at Nike. So if, if Nike ever calls and is like, hey, we want to do a collab, 100% yes. 
Getting into the footwear game, I have no idea how, what the development is on that and what it would look like. I love Nike's shoes right now and I wouldn't really change anything about them. So I'm like, hey, if they're doing it, we don't need to change. But if there's that collab, I'm down. I have a good friend of mine. Uh, his name is Justin Elrich. He used to be a professional skateboarder and he's huge into golf now. And he launched a brand recently called Number 33. And one of the coolest things that he's doing two things. One, it, it's shoes. And then the second thing he's doing is he's literally uh, adding CBD tips to golf tees or just like flavored golf tees. Cause we all put them in our mouth no matter what, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I was talking to him, he was over my house pre COVID. And to your point, he's like, this is what golf needs. You know, he's like, this is what we need. We need more edge. We need to start thinking about rethinking everything from tees. And, and, you know, just like the fact that he just put this tip was like next level to me. And he's like, and we can make that CBD and just think about where all this is going and the whole golf pro shop experience. And I was like, oh shit, you know, if we can win, and I say we like the collective youth in this whole thing, it's actually a pretty epic opportunity to take over this game completely, right? And I think yeah. that's appealing, at least from our perspective, our collective perspective, because there's no other sport like that. There's, you can't do that in the NBA. You can't do that in the NFL. You can't do that in the MLB. And so it's like, I would love, even NASCAR, I would just love for it to get hit all of a sudden, like they just removed the Confederate flag. Yeah. It's like, there's so many opportunities to take back the sport. Totally. And I, I think that's super, super cool. In terms of women lines, is it a big opportunity for golf? Is, is like the, the female golfer a growing trend as it relates to golf? I don't actually know stats on it. All I know is when we hear from, you know, retail partners, the women's line, like I think they've been struggling a lot recently with COVID where men's is selling more. I think, I think right now it's just, you know, if you look at the history of golf and this could be a total rabbit trail, but it's primarily been something that's been run out of kind of grown out of the exclusive elite male dominated, like wealthy. And so it makes sense that not a lot of women golf, because if you have male guys, kind of the ones in power controlling the space, then it makes sense that women don't play as much golf. And so I think, I think the, the, that kind of brings up a question is like, I don't think women sells as much, but I think that's because they haven't been given the opportunity to play as much. I don't think that women are necessarily like, Oh yeah. Like, let's go play together because I know a bunch of other girls that play. It's like, no, I don't know anyone else that plays. And so I think to actually change that, I think that's something that kind of this next generation you're talking about has to kind of continue to make it inclusive. And I think that's where, that's what bad bird is all about. I think for us, we want to do it on a very, we want to execute it well. And so that's kind of why we've like, we're still supporting it on the retailer side, but yeah, it, there's definitely an opportunity and, I, I mean, I always, love, it's just like, it's so rare too. I don't know about you guys, but like, I rarely see a lot of females out on the course. Like, it's just mostly, I see a lot of dudes and I think, yeah, I mean, I know my wife and her friends love playing, but there's not a lot of, yeah. So I just think about it. Like, so my wife, she owns a construction company. Shopping for her is a disaster. It's like, oh, I got to go to, where do I go? Okay. And then an extra small, they don't make them. So I got to wear a men's small right? Yeah. For anything, for hard hats, jeans, polos. And so she, she just yeah. looks like she's wearing like a trash bag. Like it's like this massive yeah. garment on her body. And I'm always like, you know, this is interesting and, and granted early days, but it's like, there's gotta be a female construction line coming soon. And I imagine this is the same case for golf where it's like shopping for things that look good or just fit period become very difficult. And so it lends itself to maybe an opportunity there. So when you think about your own marketing, I know we talked, we touched on some things. We just had Therabody on the podcast and he was saying they're just starting to sponsor some athletes. And so, you know, yeah. super, super amazing. As you think about this next year, is it diving deeper into the influencer marketing from your perspective? Is it maybe after your Thursday meeting with Robert, you're like, Hey, let's go ahead and sponsor an athlete. How, how are you thinking about yeah. that? Yeah. And that's a great question. Yeah. So for marketing, I think we've, the, the biggest thing, on our agenda right now over the next, I mean, the next couple of years is to the brand side of marketing. In marketing, you have the performance side, running ads, getting the sales funnel going, all that stuff. I think we have a pretty good lock on that. And we've continued to like, we've used that model so efficiently that we are, we've like sold out on our site. So we're trying to like continue to learn that. But on the, the side that's actually the harder side and the more creative and the more fun side, I think is the brand side. So like if Bad Birdie is about making golf inclusive, it is about reshaping the culture. How are we practically doing that? And mm. that's definitely a little bit different than like, we do that through our products. But like, to me, I'm like, we're having ideas of 
and discussions of, yeah, there's traditional ways of like sponsoring athletes. Yes, we have, we are in talks with pros and sponsoring them. And, you know, we've had a guy wear it on tour kind of just on his own. And, but it's like, how do we take it a step beyond that? How do we partner up with, you know, local golf leagues who have 200 like members who are all in their twenties and thirties, or even it doesn't matter the age who are just loving the game and have this new mentality. And how do we connect them with another golf crew like that? That's in another state. How do we welcome people to the game that, you know, we could all probably name someone who we know wants to get into golf, but doesn't have the equipment and doesn't have the skills to know how to do that. And so how can bad birdie be a way to be like, all right, well, guess what? Come hang out with us. We have the access to teachers, to basically everything you need to come in the game. And we could basically put on like my dream. I would love to do like a, almost like a intro to golf clinic or something like that to practically get people into the game. Those are, those are two ideas that come to the top of my mind. I think training people and then, or not training, but basically educating people on how to play the game. And then secondly, on just kind of connecting and empowering groups that are already doing what we're doing. Like I wasn't the one that was like, oh, golf needs to change. And that there's this new wave. I, I'm literally just jumping in and being like, I'm supporting that because there's already a movement way bigger than Bad Birdie happening that we're just trying to support along the way. So I think that's where on marketing, it's like any touch point we can do along that way and supporting that and just making it more inclusive. I, love, I went to an event at Maubon. Do you know Maubon Golf? Yep. Over here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And like, so Justin was there, he was showing like his tees and his new shoe. And I'm like, I really, did. like, what is this thing? I'm going to go to some golf store. This is going to be so boring. I really don't mm-hmm. want to do this. And my wife's like, no, we got to go support Justin. I was like, all right, whatever. And we live like two miles away. So it wasn't, it was not like a stretch to go. So we went yeah. and it's like, the, there's a DJ, there's drinks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like sexy. There's like a, a driving range room. And I was like, this is dope. Like, is this new, the new golf? And so when, when you mentioned some of the things you're describing, I can totally see that some sort of education center where it's just a nice little lead into golf and, and a different look at the same time. That makes a lot of sense. Maybe like experiential retail focused on an education component. Yeah. And there's lots of, I think lots of people are just willing to like teach, you know, and support. And it may not be, may not have to be the $300 an hour teacher at the private club, but there's the guy that's like a single digit handicapper who can like teach you some basics to at least get you on the course and playing a little bit, you know? I've never done this before, but if anyone is listening, I'm, I'm happy to donate my golf clubs to them because it would give me a reason to buy new ones. And so if anyone's listening, this is, we've never done this, but if you hit me up, I'm, I'll give you a nice set of Titleist DCIs from 1991 as an intro starter set for free. What are you going to get as your new ones? I don't know, man, but I'm excited to, to find out what's new. I know tit- I, I'm, I'm a fan of Titleist. I don't know why I've always yeah. been. Any, any yeah, recommendations? Yeah. Uh, not on, t- I don't know Titleist. I've been looking at the, uh, the tailor-made P760s, I think. I played with one of the club fitters the other week and that's what he recommended. I mean, I, the gear game, you, I can get, you can get deep into that <laughs> where you're buying new clubs all the time. So <laughs> I, try to, I try to set some boundaries around that. What's your favorite course to play? Oh yeah. Out here in LA. Yeah. Let's go for that one. Oh, favorite course. Yes. Yeah, so I live in Pasadena. I play Brookside all the time. There's two courses there. I love playing uh, Roosevelt the nine hole little muni track over there. Super fun. That's kind of like a go-to spot. I think those are kind of like my regular ones. Cause they're just so close and easy. Like on a Saturday morning, I'll be like, Hey guys, let's go play. We'll go walk nine at Roosevelt or I'll go play at three or 4 PM and get around in the summer at in Pasadena here at Brookside. I just played Angelus last week. I, that was the first time playing that, actually. That was, that's a great course. That's one I've had on my list for a while. Yeah. It's a fun course. Uh, rustic Canyon is, I mean, everyone says rustic. That's a fun one. Oak Quarry is really fun out in Inland Empire. I don't know if you guys have heard of that one. I haven't been to that For your Thursday meeting with Robert, will he take you to like, right? Will you go like Wilshire Country Club? Like, where are you going? I I wish. I need to ask him about that. We actually haven't, we haven't golfed together. We just, we've been extra safe with all the COVID stuff. But uh, yeah, no, I'm like, hey, I think he had, I mean, I don't know if I should be saying this, but he has a lot of uh, country club memberships. I forget how many. So I'm like, hey, can we, can we play at all of those? I've had a lot of awkward elevator rides with Robert. Uh, we go to the same gym. And so we oh, apparently right. like 10 a.m. is my time. It's his time. This is obviously pre-COVID. And it's just like, oh, yeah, hey, you know, it's like this weird. It happens way more often than it should. It is very That's fucking funny. weird. What gym is he going, going to? Over at the Soho house? Uh, the Equinox. That's yeah. funny. 
<laughs> you know, with running a company, I'm curious how often you actually get to go play golf these days. Cause you yeah. mentioned you're also into cycling and, and tennis as well. Yeah. I, uh, realistically, I probably play 27 holes a month. I say that because I'll probably play like last week. There's certain times where it's like, I'll play like, if I play 18 holes a week, that's like really good. But on average, I like go like two weeks without playing just because stuff's so big. And we're in peak season right now. Mm -hmm. um, so just work is crazy. The company's growing a ton. So it's, it's wild. It's not like I am not living the CEO, you know, who has an assistant doing all his work and like playing golf. Like I get like anxiety playing golf. Cause I'm like, there's too much. I can't be like gone for five or six hours during the day. So for me, it's much more about those little weekend hangs with the boys or if I can get out to play, like do that. But like, I couldn't, there's a big crew of guys playing last Friday. Like it's just a lot of stuff going on. I just can't, can't always do it. So. I understand that so well. I get out on the golf course and on the days that you can play around in four hours or less. Great. Cause that's, that's a good yeah. amount of time. And then you can still have most of the rest of your day to do whatever work that you need to get done. But on yeah. the weekends when it's slow and backed up and, I've had games take six hours and it really is a big turnoff of the sport for me because when you add in the time that it takes to drive there and warm up and then drive home afterwards, I mean, that's, you are looking at at least eight hours with a slow yep. game and it's really prohibitive for anything to get done other than that. So I totally understand that, you know, hesitation to play golf because it really like over the last year I got into golf again and then kind of diminished back down because I realized just how much time I was spending out on the course and yeah not doing other things I think Malcolm yeah. Gladwell had a really interesting podcast about that a couple of years back where he talked about all of these CEOs who were not only spending a lot of time on the golf course but actually taking the time to log their results on this um this website that tracked their scores and whatnot yep. and just he he calculated just how much time and energy and money was being wasted by them not actually doing their job so it's interesting yeah. that you you mentioned that you're not that ceo living the golf life i probably play the least amount of golf out of any like golf company owners i know i feel like it like i play less golf than my my sales guys play golf all the time i mean they're also selling right but i'm like i'm just yeah, I'm also the worst golfer on the team. Like I, all, everyone else is like scratch golfers, <laughs> but I, I mean, I love it. It's just, I, I, and I would love to get to a spot where I could do like one day a week. Like maybe that's like a one-on-one -on -one meeting or something, you know, with one of the team yeah. and we go play golf, but I think we're not there yet. I mean, we're still, Bad Birdie's still like this little scrappy company that's, we got a lot going on. So totally. I mean, we have the old adage that says a lot of business gets done on the golf course. And it sounds like your sales guys are doing just that. But at a certain point, you have to draw the line and say, okay, like, yes, I can do some business on the golf course, like, you know, rocking your polo around, people might see it and want one. But like, overall, that's not going to get your company to where you want it to be, you know, 20, $50 million valuation. You yeah. know, you do have to spend some time in the office grinding away and not on the yeah. golf course. What does the perfect exit look like for you? Is this something that you want to do for the next 10 years? Or do you see it as let's grow, 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 and then you're a young guy, sell the company, you know, in your late Yeah, 30s. yeah, no, it's a good question. And I think my, I've, I've been learning a lot and thinking about this. Have you guys read uh, The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek at all? No, no. It's really good. It's, it's shifted my mentality. He wrote Start With Why, which is what we use for all, like kind of as the basis for our branding and stuff. And he basically talks about short answer, if the right opportunity comes, I think that would be amazing. But if the right experience of running a company and having a team is also there, then there's no need to leave that. I'm not in, I guess in, in the infinite game, Simon Sinek talks about, you know, the risk and the, the downside of always just trying to build an exit. You know, I am primarily a bootstrap business. I haven't gone out and raised, I mean, Shark Tank is the exclusion, but primarily before that I built a business that is bootstrapped and never like it, I don't have, like tons of investors to report. So you'd be like, Hey, you need to have an exit. And the risk of that is that it's all about the bottom line, making profit, growing top line. It's like, it becomes a super aggressive growth trajectory that always doesn't benefit anyone else except me if I sell it or the investors versus actually 
the mission of Bad Birdie is to what we talked about, become part of this bigger movement in golf. And if by selling the company to continue to do that can help elevate that, if someone can come in and like, I don't know, TaylorMade comes in and is like, hey, we want an apparel company, we can help elevate this, great. And that's like very, I'm, I'm speaking very like, I know when someone, if someone came in and offered me a bunch of money, I'd be like, oh shit, maybe I should sell this just because. Sure. But I think right now my short-term goal is like, I just want to keep building it, keep growing. I think there's so much runway left to grow it. And yeah, I don't know if someone two years down the road is like, hey, we want to buy this company from you, maybe. Or if it's like, I run this for a cash flow business and run it for 10 years. And I don't necessarily know if I want to be in the weeds for, you know, that much like I mean I'm in the weeds now but like to do it for 10 years I'd probably want to take a step back and five years from now and have someone else kind of run the company maybe but yeah, yeah that's I don't honest know. we we have these conversations all the time when it's like what are you trying to yeah. solve for right and so there's a there's a why as it relates to your company and then there's a why as it relates to you yeah you, like what is your why do you know you like yeah. your internal why yeah that's a good question yeah I think my internal why like I think that I love, I don't know what the, I don't I, I'm reading that book actually to kind of think about that. We're doing it as a team for my personal why. I think for the business, I understand for me, I think I love like being an entrepreneur, starting something like creating value out of nothing is like, I love it. It's just like so fun. And, and it's like, I'm adding value to things and creating, you know, if I can ultimately create something outside of bad birdie, I'm totally fine with that. And I'm totally fine like my lifelong dream wasn't to create an apparel, a golf apparel company and like add value by like changing golf culture. But now that I get to do that, I'm like, that's my goal. But it could be five years from now, it could be like, well, I'm going to do something else that I can use those same skills to start something else or support another team or, you know, invest in other companies that have missions. I don't know. That's not a great answer. It's a hard question. It's, I mean, it's a hard question. Yeah, I think. And there's a journey. Picture, yeah, bigger picture. It's like, creating, adding value, supporting people. I think I've had a lot of conversations to my wife about, we've been investing a lot, building this company. That's like, in the end, it will probably, it benefits a lot of the golf world, but like, what could we do even something more philanthropic to like invest and support other areas, take the grind and the hustle we put in a bad birdie and do that to help solve like a, I don't know, I get inspired by like the, the Bill Gates documentary that came out a while ago on Netflix, like how he's trying to help solve things on a much smaller level. So I don't know. It's a good question. I need to think about. Yeah. For me personally, it, it took me two companies for me to figure out my why, right? At the beginning I was like, Oh, I want to, I want to just create, I had an apparel company and I was like, I want to do this. And, and then I was, once I started it and I was probably four years in, I was like, Oh, I'm actually doing this just to make money. And then yeah. it's like this, there's nothing wrong with that. But to me, there was yeah. everything wrong with that because it, it wasn't, it's like you chase money until you realize it's not important. So then I, so then I was like, this is stupid. So then I, yeah. I ended up selling that and then started another company this time with venture capital funds thinking like, this will be the way I make money. And then yeah. it was the same thing. I'm like, this is so dumb. Why do I keep doing this to myself? And then I had to realize my why is just how do I create value by helping people in an effort to get my time back so that I can do whatever I want. And then, it, oh, nice. and then all, and then, and then all of a sudden it was like, what things make sense? And so real estate development makes sense, but it's not multifamily because when you build a multifamily, you're only helping two people, maybe through a lifetime of this building, 30 people. We try to build really cool spaces in LA that impact thousands, you know, in the community. And then it's like this podcast, the same thing. It's like, what are we doing? We're, I'm meeting people like me, like you that do really cool things that to me are like the movers and shakers of what's happening in the country. And, and I get to talk to them and somehow this always feels like a therapy session, but at the same time, it's like, I'm hoping we help that brand a little bit, right? If they get one totally. sale, if they, if they get one fan, one Instagram like, or 10,000, whatever it ends up being yeah, yeah. to me, it's like it, that, that's the ethos of that is, is super important, but it's hard. It's hard to stay in that lane too, because obviously we're in a capitalistic society. So it's like, you got to balance both, yeah, totally. but it's a hard And it's one. like, you went, you got to make money. To, to, to keep it growing and <laughs> yeah it's, it's like both and right <laughs> the chicken and egg yeah yeah <laughs> that's so yeah. true well listen man look i appreciate you coming on the podcast let everybody know where they can yeah. find you i know you guys are restocking now so let everyone know when the next line is coming out all that good stuff yeah yeah so you can find us on badbirdygolf.com at badbirdygolf on all social we have we've been completely sold out for the last three weeks we have a 
new polo drop coming next Tuesday, July 14th. We have a lot of polos coming in there. And then, yeah, we have new drops coming August, September, October, November. So we're just monthly, we got fresh new threads coming out and keeping up with the demand and the want. So yeah, we're excited for a lot of new stuff coming out. It's exciting. And it sounds like you're hiring too. Is that right? As you move to Arizona anyway? Yeah. So yeah, we just hired a couple of people. I think we will, we kind of hired our team. Everyone's either in Arizona or moving there. So we're actually, yeah, but we will be hiring in the next, if anyone's listening and is like a product designer slash sourcing product ninja, that's what, that's what I'm looking for down the road. So, you know, connect with us, connect with me if, if that's you. Slide you into those golf, DMs. So. Yeah, that's right. Send us, an, send, send us a DM or email us just Jason at Bad Birdie. That's probably the best way to find it is saying on a podcast, right? That's it. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it, brother. Thanks for coming on the cool. podcast. Awesome, guys.